know that we had seven years of boot camp. I'm glad it wasn't like Moses. He had 40 years in the backside of the desert. <laughs> and so don't don't give up. Now, I want my bride to come up here and help me because uh, she's she's involved in this all the way. Now, uh, the, the children, uh, I thought, well, you, you know, if you're going to make a career change and do something different, you probably want to do it before the children get old enough to make choices. Huh? But here we go. We, we left the church in Farmersville, and we worked in uh, television. I got hooked on radio in Farmersville, and from there I went to television. I got to stop you right there. When I was a kid, this guy was on the radio station in Modesto, California, and he was and he was known as Haynes at the Reigns. <laughs> that was his catchphrase on the radio station, a Christian radio station. There he come on. And this is Haynes at the Reigns. I just had to throw it in there. I'm so sorry. Well, a sidebar to that is he mentioned slightly this morning about being raised around horses. So he called himself Haynes at the Gospel. Praise. Praise of the gospel. It's all right. Praise God. Well, uh, we then became the pastors of a church in Fresno, California, at Cedar and Gettysburg. At that time, it was called Pentecostal Tabernacle. And uh, uh, we pastored there, took a church of just a few people, and it grew and grew and grew. And in that period of time that we were there, we became involved with something that had swept America was Christian television. This was back before the days of satellites, and so they had to do everything live, and I became the, the first director of counseling for the 700 Club in the San Joaquin Valley. And consequently, I produced two live telethons. I want you to know there's a lot goes into production uh, before the director gets there. The director wants to know when you, you got somebody to sing, uh, who's going to give testimony and, and all of that stuff, and the producer's got to get that stuff together. And the director just says, all right, you start now, and you finish now, and, and so forth. And so uh, it, it was quite an experience, and, and um, I, uh, they decided, well, after Pat Robertson and John Gilman and Henry Harrison and all those guys left, went back to Virginia Beach, I was here, and the, the Pappas brothers, who I had worked for to begin with in radio, and, and Harry Pappas trained me, he said, he said, uh, well, we, we got some time we want you to fill. We want you to do some live television, Christian broadcasting stuff. And so in one weekend, they turned the whole weekend over to us, and I did 20 hours of live television. Great. <laughs> Henry Harrison came out and did it with me, and, and he told everybody that, that uh, I just helped him out and so forth, but that's all right, you know. He, he wrote a book entitled Second Fiddle, and so I was the second fiddle to the second fiddle. <laughs> I remember Henry Harrison on PTL, on the, uh, or not PTL, but... Uh, Christian Broadcaster, Christian 700 Club. Pat, Pat Roberts, yeah. <laughs> okay, and, and so the, to, to get to the children, the children were already teenagers. Gary, my youngest son, was 13, and our oldest son was 15, and our daughter was 7. Of course, she's going to go where mom and dad goes. But these boys, they're getting up in years when they make choices. And the, the boys, the oldest son, he's kind of adventurous. And I told him about moving to the Amazon and all this kind of thing. He said, well, let's do it. But the, the youngest son, well, let wife tell about him, Gary. Well, at the time he told us, this was a year before we went to Brazil, Gary was still only 12. He had a friend in school, Doug, a friend at church, David. And we were in the car just about ready to get out of the church and, and Dad said this to him and he said, no, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. No. I want to be a businessman. I don't want to be doing this gospel stuff. Okay, why don't you want to go? Well, because I don't want to leave my friends. <coughs> Would you pray about it? The following week we had some very dear friends. There was a lot of couples in the church that were our age with children our ages of ours, and so we did a lot of things together, so we weren't surprised when Jack and Betty called and said, can you come over this week, we want to talk. And they sent the kids to the family room and they said, listen, in order for Jack to advance, he's an assistant manager in the uh, Sears uh, automotive. automotive, and in order for him to advance, we're going to have to move 
to Reno. Okay, we're going to miss you. But if that's God's will for your life, be blessed. Okay. Another week went by, and Gary came in and said, Okay, let's go. Why, Gary? Well, I didn't want to leave Doug, and I didn't want to leave David. But remember that night we went over to the Barneses, and, and David, we were out there talking, and they're leaving, they're moving. And I went to school the next few days. My friend Doug said, now he was from a divorced family. And he said, Gary, we've been friends this year, and I've been living here with my dad and my stepmom. But next year, my mom wants me to go to Hawaii where she lives with her husband, and I have to move. Gary said, I'm not leaving my friends. They both left me. You know, God will, how many know, when you, when you make a step for God, God will begin to move obstacles. You know, uh, if anyone knows that right now, Nick and Tina, they just, uh, God has just led them to go to Hawaii. And they'll be leaving here in a few weeks. But uh, all the, I mean, I've been uh, carefully just monitoring all the steps here. But every step along the way, God has been working with you. Let me, let me kind of ask you another question. Okay. We're going to condense these a little bit here. Yeah, or I won't be able to uh, ask you very many questions. When you, when you first went to, uh, uh, to Brazil, you, you went to the Amazon Basin, right? Yeah. It started out they were going to send us to the southern part of Brazil. We even had prayer cards printed. But then they came at the last minute and changed and said, no, you're going to the Amazon, the city of Manaus. And uh, that, now, that's where you we centered out of Manaus. Out of Manaus. Which is in the Amazon Valley. It's a thousand, it's a thousand miles up the Amazon River. Uh, let, me, let me ask you a question. Have you ever, in, in the missionary ventures, you know, we've seen these, you know, way distant pictures about uh, people getting in those little little log canoes and whatever. Did you, was that ever a, a mode of transportation? All the time. All the time. But get in those little canoes and, yep. and, and bring the gospel to the villages yep. across the, the Amazon River. Yep. How primitive when you went there with some of these villages and, and these tribes? Well, I, I, don't, I don't know. It was a, a, a thing of contradiction. Very modern. You go buy a, a cabin with thatch roof that's uh, roof on the banks of the river and see a TV antenna sticking out. <laughs> And, and uh, because the Amazon jungle, the, the Brazilian government had opened it up to uh, free trade. It's called a Zona Franco, a free zone. And so they could import stuff from all over the world, not pay big duties on it and all kinds of stuff. And so they had all kinds of high class stuff. Uh, and and uh, to start off with, the, the, the experiences we had, we, were, we got there July the 9th, 8th, 1976. Was and July a hot time of the year there? No, that's the winter time. That's winter time. Okay. <laughs> it's still hot. It's still hot. <laughs> it, it's, it, it's a Turkish bath in the Amazon jungle, 365 days a year, 24 seven. So, all the time. I, I lost 30 pounds and never missed a meal. Turkish bath. Well, uh, in in just a few months, we bought a riverboat, and I thought, man, I'm you know. Uh, how many of you kind of like to kind of help God out? And so I said, well, a friend of mine had access to uh, aircraft navigational charts. And I thought the biggest problem of getting around in the Amazon is to know where the rivers are and where to go. And so he got me a set of full color aircraft navigational charts. Here we buy a, a riverboat that has a two cylinder diesel engine. It runs a whole five miles an hour. <laughs> Uh, I mean, we're talking about a boat that's uh, eight foot wide and forty foot long, so it's it's pretty good size houseboat, and and we lived on it and, and all of those kind of things, and and we had some experiences. I want you to know that uh, we we lost the propeller off the boat. Uh, we bent the rudder in the boat before we uh, really got started started good. Uh, I've I've run the boat on rocks. I've run it on sandbars. Uh, I've, I've gotten in the piranha infested waters to get I the boat out. I was just going to ask you that. Yeah. Did you ever run in any yeah, places where you couldn't stick your food off, foot off the boat because of the piranhas? Well, you see, we, television has distorted our vision of what a piranha fish is. Right. There are only two species of piranha fish that are carnivorous. The rest of them are vegetarian. And uh, so it, it's not that dangerous. And I have been swimming in all kinds of places in the Amazon. I remember one time we were in a little boat and it got stuck on a, a log and we couldn't get it out and, and everybody was afraid. Have you ever seen the movie The African Queen and Humphrey Bogart? 
Well, uh, Humphrey Bogart got in there and the leeches got on him. Well, I got in at the water because I'm, I'm a pretty good sized little guy, you know. And the boat was stuck and it couldn't get it out. And so I got in the water, under the water, under the boat, and got lifted the boat up and shoved it off the, the log so that we could keep going because it wouldn't go otherwise. So we've had some, we've had some interesting experiences. I, I have a 25 foot anaconda snake skin. I quit carrying it around with me because one lady almost had a heart attack. But I, I, I would roll it down the aisle. I roll it down the aisle, and uh, she, uh, they told me later, said, Pastor, you, you shouldn't have done that. Amen. Yeah. But but, uh, I want to ask you, I want to ask you a couple questions about. You, you said something yesterday. You said the same paradigms, the same principles that work here, yeah. work there. Yeah. Prayer works here, prayer works there. I want to ask you about your first breakthroughs, yeah. where, where you began to disciple and, 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 and got your first major uh, breakthroughs as far as planting churches and, and, okay. and the key individuals. If okay. you could dance that as best you can. What, what, it, what it happens, and how many of you know that when you uh, start with someone else's work, you've got to plug in where they are? And we, had, we became involved in the work that had already been going for a number of years. It had been going since 56, and we, were, we got there in 76. And uh, so, uh, but a, a, an interesting thing that I found out, because of being in full-time ministry and the gifts of spirit operating in my life, I went to Brazil and I couldn't understand a thing they were saying, but the Holy Ghost had shown me that person needs help. And this is, and, and I, I could just walk into church and, and the Lord just, yeah. and I couldn't communicate. I couldn't talk to them. I didn't have an interpreter. I, I, we didn't have an interpreter. And so I said, God, I got to do something about this. And believe it or not, Somebody that flunked Greek twice in Bible school. I flunked it twice. I started preaching in Portuguese in six months. And, and uh, first thing that I did is I started discipling the pastors and relating to them and developing friendships with them. And uh, we, we uh, then uh, endeavored to inspire pastors. I'm going this trip. I'm going to a city by the name of Silvius. It's a city that was a, founded by an Indian tribe. And we went there with our riverboat. They, they were a, a pioneer church that was just getting going and I went there to encourage the worker. They didn't have lights. And I had a, a butane gas light that it stood on, put it on the butane bottle and stood up in the air. And I, I gave it to them. And we worked there with those Indians. And God just moved by His Spirit. We saw people saved and filled with the Spirit. But how many of you know that uh, at the same time, you've got some pretty rough things. One of the things that's hard to deal with, and she has a lot of trouble with it, and I did too, is mosquitoes. That butane light, we saved up for over four months to be able to afford to buy it. And in our first trip out with it, we got to that place and God said, they need it more than you do. They got it. There is now a thriving church there, and, and it's, it's going well, and uh, I've not been back there since the days that we went on the riverboat. I want to go there. I made a request to the, district, the general superintendent that I'm going to, uh, with him to the interior for a leadership conference, a mentoring <coughs> leadership conference that I'm going to be a part of, and, and uh, I said, I, I want to go to Sylvie's. I, I, think it, I think it's worthwhile. Now, uh, probably, uh, guys, the, the greatest thing that we can do is the, what I talked about this morning, is synergism. We multiply through one another. We encourage one another. We love one another. We multiply through one another. And often what you produce uh, is a few. But together we are able to reach yes. millions, hundreds of millions of people yes. because of the multiplication principle. So uh, my, pers my personal experience of actually pastoring a church is I took a church there in the Amazon. And, and how many of you know that the, the missionary is supposed to have all the answers? You know? 
And, and we took the church that the pastor had messed up morally and, and all kinds of stuff. And, and so we took the church, uh, uh, Emilio Moreira. And uh, uh, I thought, well, we'll just turn this thing around. There. I think they had 15, 10 or 15 people. And, and uh, uh, we're going to turn it around. I said, we're going to go out in the neighborhood and evangelize. And so we got the people, a few that would come. And we went out, you go this way, you go that way, and I'll go, I'll go this way. And, and I went down the street, and everyone that I talked to promised me that they'd be there Sunday. And I thought, man, this is really working. All two or three, one of them said, well, you, you, you're from that church up there that Pastor so-and-so was there? He said, she said, that you, you see that house over there? The, 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 the pastor's daughter used to sleep with this married man down there. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, uh, folks, we live in a real world. Yes. And, and I, I, I had, we had to deal with it. We, had, we dealt with it. We helped them. We loved these people and, and did what we could. And that, that church, I only stayed there just long enough to get another Brazilian pastor because here's something about mission strategy. You that are, the, the greatest thing, this is why discipleship is so important, the greatest in results in, in uh, mission strategy is for someone to evangelize someone that is culturally close to them. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, someone that you have some kind of an identification with. Yes. One of the biggest measuring sticks of finding out whether a person is really effective as a missionary, and we sing about God is my friend, how many friends do you have in that culture? I mean, you talk about friends when it comes holidays, you spend the holidays with them, you have them over for coffee or, or to barbecue and, and all of those kind of things that, that your friend, that you, you share with one another. And so uh, it, it, it really is important. And uh, we, we really, really have a challenge to reach the world with the gospel. The color of skin, the language differences, the cultural differences, but they're all we're all we're able to reach them all <coughs> if we'll do it one at, one at a time. Amen. I want to ask you one more question. We'll keep it brief, and then then I I'll invite you to preach. But today, just do a, kind of a consensus. Uh, and, and I know that numbers is is, is kind of a, a difficult statistic. Yeah. But uh, how many churches basically uh, from nineteen what was it when you went seventy six? When you went there in seventy six. Uh, how, how many churches do we have now that is a result of the ministry that I know you were the general overseer over mm -hmm. all of the Brazilian area back in uh, up till 85 and when, when we yeah. when we went we there, there when we went there there were about 50 churches huh? the, no in the whole about 50 churches because okay. they count churches different there congregations are not counted as churches that that uh, have a, an ongoing ministry and so forth. And then they may have two or three congregations. Well, the pastor, the missionary that was there before us counted anybody that had any meeting even or a shade tree as a church. And so he gave a, a report of about 80 uh, churches, but they were, there were not 80 churches. But uh, the, the, what has happened today, and Wanda and I spent oh, probably 15 years not a direct part of the Pentecostal Church of God, but working it on an interdenominational basis. <clears throat> and so, but in, in those, the people that we've planted, and I thought, uh, how many of you know that, that the hardest thing in the world is to do something that you're doing and do it well, and, and uh, I, 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 never, I never wanted to be a theology teacher. I never thought I could. I, I couldn't even preach because I didn't know how to find a sermon. Uh, none of you had that problem. You know everything. You know, get it all figured out real quick. But I, 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 pre I pastored in the church for uh, uh, two months and didn't have any more sermons. <laughs> That's that first one's tough. Huh? I, I, read, I read the Bible cover to cover every week and couldn't find a sermon in it until I found out how to study, yeah, how to read, and how to, how to prepare things. But, but uh, we... we uh, uh, started investing in people's lives and involving people. Mentoring huh? the pastors. Mentoring, Mentoring the pastors, pastors and yes. developing the pastors. And, and, and 
Back to the point. Okay. Uh, well, How many churches are we at now that were influenced under the ministry that, since you guys have been in here? in Brazil? Yes. About three hundred churches. Praise God. And they're growing. I, and the thing of it is, we're not talking about little churches. We're talking about some churches, several churches that I know of that have. 500, 700, 900,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. One church has 5,000 members. And it started in a, in a favela on the banks of the, Am the Il Negro River. And, and so it, it's amazing what God does yes. when people give themselves to preaching and practicing the Word. And uh, it, it, it's amazing, powerful, what, what the, the work of, of God does. And... Uh, in our interdenominational ministry, we have graduated over 1,300 students from a Bible school, probably another three to 4,000 that studied at least one semester. We have uh, pastors that have planted at least 500 churches in Brazil. And we have uh, graduates from our Bible school, Christ for the Nations, in Belo Horizonte, Brazil, that are on the mission field in probably 30 different countries. Praise God. And so, I just want to do a quick summary there. We now have our, and just influence over 300 churches. You've had over a thousand students graduate from the Bible school and 3,000 that have attended at least semesters yes. or more. And these are all ministers seeking to go into the ministry. 90% of them that graduate from the Bible school, either from the denominational Bible school or from the our interdenominational school, go into some kind of active ministry. Praise God. Let's give God a praise. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you.